Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Andrew Lillico, who is a director and principal of Europe Economics. Like Ruth, Andrew is also a member of the Institute of Economic Affairs Shadow Monetary Policy Committee. Andrew gained his PhD at University College London and then lectured in money and banking, macroeconomics and corporate finance. Uh, Andrew, like Ruth, is another frequent contributor to CNBC business. And in the last week alone, he started up two very important debates. The first one about the merits of central bank independence. And secondly, I notice on Conservative Home, he's launched a critique of the Conservative leadership over the last 15 years for ignoring Conservative intellectuals. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Lilly. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you Ruth for, uh, it's nice to know that somebody read that uh, Open Europe in their paper, since it was a kind of pricey of a paper that we'd done for them. Uh, I believe that, well I know that they did at the Treasury in number 10, since they based their negotiating position at the 78th uh, 2011 um, uh, uh, treaty negotiations on that, on the Fiscal Union Treaty, which incidentally was a treaty they didn't sign. Um, but uh, there we go, that was nice to know somebody else read it as well. Um, so, unlike most of you in this room, and unlike probably most of the speakers today, I've never been in favour of leaving the EU, and uh, it's not something I uh, advocate now. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I would quite like to say to you is that it seems to me that that whole debate is irrelevant, in that the EU is over. Right? The EU that we belong to is at an end. So questions of in or out and so on don't really enter the equation. There's only out or more out at this stage. Right? So, because the reality of the EU is, and, and I mean that, there are, there are various things that one could mean by that. Okay, so it's possible that the, uh, that the euro collapses and the whole EU project uh, collapses. I don't think that's um, uh, favorited with the way things are going in the uh, Eurozone. It's not terribly unlikely, but I don't think it's the most likely scenario. Uh, I mean something much more concrete and specific. Um, what's, what's happening is that in response to the Euro crisis and in uh, pursuit of the project of the European Union as it always was from the beginning, um, they are converting the European Union into an EU federation. Now, if you went back 15, 20 years to those of us who were um, fa favoured renegotiation back in the past, like myself, there was the possibility of having a kind of two spheres Europe, different kinds of Europe, where one part of it would go ahead rapidly to the single European state, another part might have another kind of relationship. I think it's very clear from the EU Fiscal Union Treaty, where 23 people signed up and then the rest don't, that there's really only the EU now. There isn't any, any longer a kind of two spheres option. There's the people who are members of the Euro, the people who are shortly going to be members of the Euro, and then some irrelevances. That's basically how it works in the EU. With this EU Federation, the EU Federation will vote on block and they will have a qualified majority voting, uh, a qualified majority. So what happened was that we entered into an arrangement whereby we, had, um, we would negotiate with our uh, partners within the agreement. Sometimes we'd win, sometimes they'd win. If we could get enough allies on our side, that would work for us. If we could get enough allies, we could block things, get a blocking, a sufficient blocking minority. Um, all of that's gone. Right. With the EU Federation, the EU Federation will vote on block, it will have a qualified majority, and that means that we will have to do whatever it is that they want. They will set the rules for the single market in the future. The EU arrangement whereby sometimes we won, sometimes we lost, is over. That will mean that our status, by around 2016, 2017, whenever this really um, gets solidified, will be equivalent to that of Norway now. So we will contribute to the EU budget as Norway does now. We will have opted out of most of the EU state building projects. We're not going to be part of the EU police force or army or any of those kind of things. Right? So we will have opted out of all of that stuff as the EU has, as the Norway has now, and we will be subject to single market rules set by others, as Norway is now. So whatever you call it, right, whether we still hold a, a card that says I am a proud member of the EU, the reality is that our status by then will be equivalent to Norway's status now as an out. So all that we have, even the just carry on as we are option, is an option in which we are out. The correct way to frame this debate is, do we want that kind of out from the EU, or do we think that we can do better than that kind of out? So when I frame, when I put things this way, sometimes people suggest, so you're saying we shouldn't bother about any of this kind of um, changing our deal with the EU at all, since we're just going to be out anyway. No. 
Why, who would, why would anyone imagine that I thought a Norway-style out was a good arrangement? It's a terrible arrangement. The right way to frame this is what alternative could we have another kind of out which was better than that Norway out? I would also caution you, there is a, there's going to be a referendum. I've never been in favour of having a referendum. I thought we should just renegotiate. But there, there is going to be a referendum at the next general election. Um, many, of you, many people seem to, I, I think this whole uh, allegation that somehow it's going to be an in-in referendum is totally white of the mark. Not because there, there's the possibility of an in-out. The, the reason people say this is that David Cameron has been resistant to saying he's going to have an in-out referendum. What he says is he's not going to have an in-out referendum because in is totally unacceptable. It's going to be, what the, the likely referendum will be that we have, he seeks to renegotiate, he takes that renegotiated package to the people. If, we, if people agree to that in a referendum, then that's what we'd have. Otherwise, we'd leave. So the likely referendum is going to be an out or more out referendum. That's the kind of referendum we'll have. I believe all the major parties will offer a referendum of some sort at the next general election, including the Labour Party. I don't know whether the Labour Party's options would be exactly the same as the Conservatives' options. They might have three options. Who knows? But I think it's likely we will have a referendum. Uh, and I think that... Even if we were to see, I think the most likely scenario is that we, uh, the government goes, seeks to renegotiate something, and what they seek to renegotiate is rejected. I see an enormous appetite on the part of the British public just to say no. 86% of people wanted to ta uh, have a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty. I can assure you that that wasn't because they wanted to vote yes. Uh, what, what's happened in the, in the public is that people look around and they see all these other countries, the Danes and the French and the Dutch, and Netherlanders and so on, they all had their go at saying no to various things. And we, people in Britain feel like, we never really got to you know, stick our two Battle of Ashencourt fingers up at the EU. And they will take that opportunity. So I think that, um, it, that it will be most unlikely that anything happens in that referendum other than a no. If it were to be anything other than a just, we're just going to reject any renegotiated package, it will be because it's framed as an in-out referendum. And I, and I would caution you on this point. If you want to improve upon that kind of, um, uh, if you want to do any better than a Norwegian inn, if that appears among the options, do not characterize that as an inn. In referendums all around the world, there's an enormous bias to the status quo. If you can tell people, your options are, you can carry on with things pretty much as before, you know, the life that you've had, carry on much the same jobs, there's good things and bad things about that, but the world carrying it matches you much as it has done. Or you can go for something completely different. What happens is that when, when you put that to people in advance, they think it's all terribly romantic, the idea of having something different. So opinion polls in advance say, oh, isn't it great? We'll go for the new spangly thing. But then when they actually sit there in a, in a booth and they think about it, they think, actually, maybe I'll just prefer to carry on as I have before. If you characterize the referendum as being between and in, as carry on as it was before, and who knows what as an alternative, a vague out, then that's the most likely way in which we will end up with it going for an in option. The way to frame this debate, if you want to have anything other than we carry on with the least change, is to frame it as, as our EU membership is over, and the question is what we do next. That, that I would urge upon you as the way to frame this discussion. The, if we were to think about what it is that we want to do instead, and I, I, think it's, I think there are all kinds of possibilities here, I think that the right way to think about that is not that you go out into the world and you just operate as yourself. Not that that's lonely, not that that's disastrous, but I think one has to understand what the purpose is of these kind of international trading agreements. The central purpose for a medium-sized country of its trading agreements is not trade. These are fundamentally political in nature. What you do is you combine with some paddles so as to project your values geopolitically out into the broader world. At a time, once upon a time, once it, when uh, having pals of France and Germany and Italy and so on, they were pretty good pals. We had broadly similar values in terms of some of the concerns, looking towards the Soviet Union, things of that sort, seeking to extend democracy into the Iberian Peninsula, absorbing the post-Soviet um, uh, breakup accession states, that kind of thing. No, that, those weren't such bad pals to have. If you 
you are a tiny country, if you are Switzerland, and who's opted, opted out of world affairs for two centuries, then just making ad hoc agreements with whoever, that's kind of an attractive thing to do. If you're the largest country, if you're the British Empire in the 19th century, if you're the US hegemon today, then you can just impose the trade agreements on others. So you don't have to go and have some narrow set of mates. If you're a medium-sized country, you do better with some mates. Now, as it happens, I think that there aren't going to be any medium-sized mates to have in Europe anymore because we're going to have this great uh, uh, leviathan of the EU Federation, which will be one of the world's great powers, um, which will uh, come into existence very shortly. So that's not really an option for us anymore. So we should be seeking some other medium-sized mates. Who are the right medium-sized mates for us to have? I would say that um, the, the best alternatives out there, there are various things you can imagine, but the best alternatives out there are probably the um, Australians, Canadians. They're the right sort of scale for us. We can offer a much more mutually uh, intimate relationship, a relationship much closer to that of equals with them than we could with, say, the United, than they will get with the United States, or we could obtain, say, with the United States. Uh, I think that the right kind of makes to have our people of that kind of order who share similar values, similar history, and so on with us. I think that that's the right way to frame things. And the right thing to think is not just we leave, it's we do that instead. Or we seek to do that instead. You win arguments if you offer a better alternative. It's like all kinds of, if you think of any, I'm very pop hairy about these things. This may be a language that appeals to a, a, few, a few of you out there in the audience. I think it's a terrible idea to abandon something. Here, I'll give you an example. My wife frequently irritates me by throwing away the last dish brush. And I try to urge upon her, the last dish brush, it's got all, right, it's, it's started to bend over here and it doesn't work very well anymore. I say, yes, but we don't throw away the last dish brush until we have another dish brush. We need to have a better alternative before we reject the thing that we have. And just saying, I don't want to have a dish brush at all, I think is the wrong way of going about things. The only merit of that would be if you thought, if I throw away my dish brush, that means that I'm pre-committing to going and seeking something else, right? some other arrangement. So if you think that, the only way, if you despair of the thought that the British would ever seek to project themselves to be involved in the world, in world affairs by seeking other kind of partners, for us first to nihilistically abandon everything and leap out into the void, then, of course, you might think that that was the thing to do. Personally, I'm, I think that we can have a better, a more concrete ambition than that. Another, so what would, be, what would be a kind of dream scenario for me here would be something like the following. I imagine us going, leaving the EU, because that's over, I imagine us leaving the EU and then seeking a, perhaps, perhaps we could get an arrangement with the Australians and the Canadians. Maybe that arrangement could inherit the Canadian NAFTA membership and then countries, so investors from China and Brazil and whatever, might invest into the UK as a means of access for their, their into NAFTA. Similarly, we might find that single market compliant goods we were able to export into the EU. One thing about um, one thing about the renegotiation strategy, the idea of this, and it's connected with this point, is one reason why that's likely to fail now, uh, in the way that it might not have failed in the past, is that because the EU is building this single state in this way, it's going to have a lot of other things to do. It's going to be spending its time passing new treaty after new treaty, many of which may require a um, referendum in the Czech Republic, and the Ireland, and the Netherlands, and so on getting through their EU police and their EU central budget and their EU um, army and all this kind of stuff, the last thing that they're going to want to do is to either attach some rearranged position for the British to one of those treaties and risk them being rejected, or delay passing of some referendum so that they can pass the referendum on our re new renegotiating conditions. I think that the whole renegotiation thing is over. The last chance we had of doing anything on that sort was around 2010, I would say. I think that's now done. And I think we saw that in 2011. So whereas in 2010, when David Cameron went out and he agreed to the revision of the Lisbon Treaty, which occurred then, which led to the ESM Treaty in the middle of 2011, um, the, that was the revision of a treaty of which we were signatories. So they needed our consent in order to go along with that. Now, they're just going to have a whole series of new treaties. So we saw in 2011, when, when he went along and tried to renegotiate the tiniest, teensiest little bit of financial services regulation powers, they just said, well, if you don't know the end, then we'll just go and form a different treaty. They weren't interested 
anymore because they felt they had better things to do. They're going to feel like they have better things to do all through the next decade. It will be much more straightforward for them simply to allow us to leave and perhaps with some phased ending of our single market access in the formal sense. And then as once we've exited, we then renegotiate with them from outside some new market access procedures. And that's quite easy. I mean, nobody thought there was any great fuss within the EU. You didn't see the Irish rejecting some free trade agreement with Israel or Turkey or whatever, right? Or any of the other kinds of um, customs union free trade agreements that things that the EU has. It's quite straightforward for it procedurally to agree um, trade negotiations with third countries. That's one of the things which you pass to them as a power under the whole single market process. It's much more tricky for you to agree any revision to things internally. So in practice, it will be much easier for the EU members just to say, just go, and then we'll sort out the whole single market thing afterwards. And I think that there is a realistic possibility that we could have single market access as um, non-members. Uh, I know some of you don't think single market access is a terribly nice idea. Uh, I think you're mistaken. But one thing that I would say about the way that the single market has gone, because we should just ponder a little how attractive the single market access will be, is the following. The main way in which we gained from uh, economically from EU membership Bearing in mind, as I say, that the main gains from these things are never economic in the first place. They're mainly about political effects that you have. Um, the main way, way we gained economically through the single market was through our influence over the policy of Italy and, and other countries. Because what happened within the EU was that at the central, particularly the Commission, they were very interested in British ideas. And what would typically happen is that you would have a measure which, which was liberalising for most of the EU, in fact, in some cases, it was so like the British policy already that in Britain, it would just seem like you've just changed a few of the rules without having any real effect. So in Britain, they would say, well, it's just a stupid rule, right? You haven't actually changed any of the substance of things. You've imposed loads of petty you know, compliance costs of changing the way that we do things without actually having any effect. And then that would be complained about. And what wasn't recognised, I think, usually in the British press, was that that was precisely because we made other countries do things like us. And because that was the key, key game, the intellectual game that we had within the EU, was that we exported our ideas across the European Union. I want to say that that process, which went through particularly from, say, the early 1980s through to the mid-2000s, is really an end. With the financial crisis, people have decided that the, uh, it was the Anglo-Saxons those terrible Anglo-Saxons with all that deregulation, all that capitalism, unfettered capitalism, and all that kind of language that has led to these things, the last thing they want to be doing is listening to Anglo-Saxons about how you resolve them. And so the whole direction, the whole thrust, the underlying impetus of the EU single market project is going right away from us. Of course, we've changed some of our regulatory trends in response to the financial crisis as well, but the ways that we've done that are quite they're significantly divergent from those within the EU, and they just aren't going to be interested in doing things our way in the future. And that's quite a significant loss, that intellectual pressure. One of the implications of that would be, of course, once we left the EU, and, we were, and we, all that we had was just abiding by rules set by them, we shouldn't assume that that would continue to be significantly advantageous to us, even over the medium term. So there is a risk that we would sign up for some single market rules, and then find actually, after a while, we didn't want to abide by them at all, and we just rather have a free trade agreement. So I think that that is a possibility, um, but I'm hopeful for now at least that what we could secure is an arrangement in which we had single market access with single market rules and client effects. We didn't have to pay high tariffs on them subsequently. They, didn't, they, they came and they exported things to us uh, in, the, in much the same way. Um, so. Uh, uh, International investors, Americans, and so on, would find that we were launching off point into Europe. Others would find that we were launching off point into NAFTA. And then we would combine with our Australian Canadian allies, probably in a significant increase in our populations, because we would like, I think that there's a great potential for Britain to be a very significant importer of people. And we tended to resist being an importer of people in recent years because we haven't had such the, uh, the opportunities that we had in the past say in the period of the empire, to export people in the same way. 
If we combined with sufficiently like-minded other countries, I think that we would then go back to being very significant exporters of people out to them as well, and could be more welcoming of importers, uh, of imported people. And I think that that change in the migration dynamic is another thing that we should anticipate as a consequence of leaving the EU, and we should not neglect its longer-term significance. So to sum up, in my view, we are um, our EU membership, as we've understood it, is over or it will be over within a very short time. So the whole in-out discussion is a red herring. The correct discussion to be had is out or more out. I think that that is, in fact, um, likely to be, uh, there's a pretty good chance at least, that that will be the way the discussion works. I think it's uh, almost certain that there will be referendum offered by the, uh, the uh, Labour and Conservative parties at the next general election. I think that that there should be the opportunity to negotiate some kind of new deal which could be more attractive than just simply exiting. But I think that there's a pretty good chance that what will happen is that we just simply exit without working out what it is that we're going to do first, which I think could be a bit of a shame. Um, but and the, uh, over the medium term, we should be seeking other new medium-sized country allies, perhaps having single market access, but already thinking ahead to the point in the future where perhaps even single market access might not be attractive to us. Thank you.